Greetings, class. Uh, this is the lesson uh, meant for October 3rd. Um, we will be looking at some, um, some uh, verses in Genesis chapter 4 and chapter four, 5. And we'll kind of be jumping around. So uh, you might want to have your Bible with you. Uh, the Gospel Project entitles this Sin Spreads. Uh, it actually is the story of Cain and Abel. Um, last lesson, we saw that the decisions that Adam and Eve had made cracked the foundations of man's relationship with his creator, uh, cracked that foundation big time, um, beyond anything that Adam or anyone else since him, um, could repair. Um, the only one that really could repair it was God himself, since he was the offended and so he sent his son uh, in the form of a man, because man was the offender, <laughs> and um, he was God, who was the one that was offended. And that is why Jesus Christ could pay the price and repair that foundation when mankind himself was uh, totally unable to do so. <clears throat> but life for Adam and Eve, remarkably, went on, did it not? Um, not as God originally intended, no, but um, as he allowed it to, by his grace, uh, he still provided, God did, he still protected, and uh, he still sustained uh, Adam and Eve and the world in which they lived, as he does, as he does still. He still provides, he still protects, and he still uh, sustains um, us. And whether we are believers or not, we benefit, we are blessed from that, from that blessing. Um, Adam's family, the scripture tells us, uh, settled uh, east of Eden. They grew in number. They grew in uh, transgression too, unfortunately. Uh, we are not evolving. The human race is not evolving. We are not getting better and better morally or ethically. Uh, we are um, we are devolving, uh, and that is all a result of inheriting the curse that was pronounced on our parents, uh, Adam and Eve. We begin in chapter four in verses one and two, uh, and then move on from there. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, "I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord." And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. Um, Adam and Eve were not necessarily Adam and Eve's first children. They may have been, but not necessarily. They may have been their first sons, but not necessarily. Uh, they were definitely not their only children. The scripture tells us that they had many sons and daughters, uh, which would have been necessary in order to... Um, in order to uh, increase and multiply and fill the earth, would would it not? That that's just kind of common sense. God had passed judgment on Adam and Eve, <clears throat> um, as we mentioned, or I mentioned that the foundation of their relationship with God was cracked. Death had entered their reality, um, and yet we see new life. I I wonder if Adam and Eve. Uh, the thought ever went through their minds, was Satan right? Um, would we surely not die? Uh, well, death would become a reality to them soon enough. They had actually already died spiritually. Uh, they were out of the tangible presence of God. They were restricted from the tangible presence, actual physical presence of God. Sin would plague not only their lives, but uh, it would be inherited by their children and plague their lives. That was their new reality. It is remarkable that God even let them live physically for as long as he did. Uh, but, of course, we do know that with God, there, there is no time. But uh, for us, in thinking in human terms, they lived good, long lives, uh, certainly a lot longer than what we see people living in, living today. Continuing in verse 3 to 5 in chapter 4 of Genesis, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. 
and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. So both young men had brought respect, had respectable occupations. Uh, Cain was a farmer uh, and um, Abel was a shepherd. Um, they both approached God with offerings that represented what their vocations were. So why did God accept Abel's and reject Cain's offering? Was it the, uh, the nature of the offering that God preferred blood offering over a produce? There's nothing in the scripture that indicates that that had, that that had happened. Even, even when we see um, the laws um, <clears throat> set down uh, in the Mosaic law, the, the laws that God gives Moses, there is provision for both blood offering and produce offering, a grain offering. I, I don't think that was it, although some would say that was the reason. Was it the quality of the offering? Was it because Abel offered the firstborn and Cain offered only from the harvest? I don't think so. Um, it would have been difficult for Cain to offer the, the first of his harvest. Um, it would be better for him to offer the best and not the first. <clears throat> was it the monetary value of the offering. Certainly a, um, <clears throat> a sheep uh, is of much more value than a basket of tomatoes and cucumbers, it would seem. Um, I don't think that was it either. Um, was it the heart of the giver? Was it the way in which the, the, the giver presented the offering? Ah, I think they, I think that is, that is it. That is what made the difference. Actually, Hebrews 11.4 uh, tells us the reason why God accepted Abel's offering. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Through his faith, um, it was a recognition on Abel's part of what his standing was before God. It was the, um, his heart was open toward God. Scripture tells us something very similar um, regarding Abraham. Abraham was brought up in an idolatrous um, civilization. His culture was idolatrous, um, and yet he had a heart toward God. He recognized the, uh, the superiority and the authority of the one true God. And so he was, uh, he was declared righteous because of his heart. Uh, Jesus tells the Jewish leaders in the Matthew 23, verses 33 to 35, you serpents, you brood of vipers, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, so that on you may come all the righteous bloodshed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. <clears throat> um, here is Jesus acknowledging that the uh, Abel had been killed because of the condition of his heart, that Cain was jealous of his brother's um, heart towards God and God's response to that. John tells us why Cain's offering was rejected in 1 John 3.12. We should not be like Cain, John says, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's it, Cain's uh, deeds, John tells us, were evil, his brothers were not. Um, but um, Cain was not repentant of his evil deeds. Regardless of the fact that his deeds were evil, if he had acknowledged that they were and come to God in repentance, then God would have given him the forgiveness that he requested, that he begged for, but he didn't. And so he was jealous because his brother's acts 
were righteous. They were towards God because he had a heart toward God. And God acknowledged that and responded to Abel by accepting his offering and rejecting um, Cain's. <clears throat> Going back to Genesis in verse uh, 6 and 7 of chapter 4. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain hasn't said a word that is recorded here, but his countenance, his body language reveals his heart. And so God graciously, really, addresses Cain with a series of questions. He says, uh, why are you angry? Uh, why has your face fallen? Why the big pout? Um, why are you um, why are you frowning? Um, if you do if you do well, like your brother Abel, will you not be accepted? In essence, God is saying, if you had made this offering with a different heart, then I would have accepted it. The problem is not with the offering. The problem is with the attitude behind the offering. What was God inviting Cain to do? If you do well, will you not be, will you not be accepted? What was he asking him to do? Do well. What was it that he had to do in order to do well? Confess his sins, acknowledge God's authority, and ask God's forgiveness. That was what it was that he had to do to rectify the situation. And if he did not, then God tells him exactly what's going to happen. He says, sin, it's crouching at the door. Um, its desire is, um, is contrary to you. Um, you. You need to get it under control. You need to rule over it, Cain. There's still an opportunity, Cain, for you to set things right between you and me. I am anxious, God says. Just make it right, and I will respond to that. The danger was within Cain, not outside of him, had nothing to do with the offering. The offering was an expression of his heart, just as Eve eating the fruit was the outward expression of an inward uh, consideration that she had a right to, um, to question God's judgment, um, that she could be the judge of the judge so to speak. Um, her sin was in thinking she could judge God's word and eat, and she ate the forbidden fruit as an external expression of an inward, um, an inward attitude. Same with Cain. The, the, the offering that he made was an outward expression of what he really thought. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, verse 8, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Was it because he had anything against Abel? Who was he really rebelling against? He was really rebelling against God and God's judgment of him. And his killing of Abel was again an outward expression, a very dramatic outward expression of what was going on in his heart. He had nothing against Abel. Abel had been obviously nothing but good to Cain. And yet his, um, his attitude, his um, sin had in, indeed crouched at his door. Cain knew God's command, but he stepped over it. He picked a fight with his brother. He attacked him and he killed him. James 1.15 says, Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. If we entertain sin and make sin our God, if we put our sin in the place of God, then the progression or the digression, if you want to think about it that way, of sin, doing that to sin, <coughs> um, 
will result in death, whether it's actual physical death or whether it is um, hardening of the heart to the point that it is in essence dead. That is what happens. Moving down in chapter 4 to verse uh, 17, we're told that Cain is now married, and um, here is the genealogy of his descendants. Uh, genealogies in the scripture can be uh, tough reading. <laughs> if, if you want to um, you want to get a little sleepy and have trouble sleeping, then read the genealogies. They're bound to put you asleep. But they are extremely important in the Bible. They are extremely important to the Jews. And I think we've talked about this before, that uh, there was a time when any Jewish boy would be able to tell you who his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, his great-great-great-great, go all the way back, uh, perhaps all the way to Abraham, and maybe even all the way back to, to Adam um, uh, in, his, in his genealogy. Very, very important in the scripture. <coughs> First of all, it allows us to uh, trace Jesus back to King David and Abraham and Noah and uh, eventually to Adam. Um, uh, it, it tells us what makes up the genealogy of, of Jesus, which is very interesting in, in the very least. Um, but it can, be, it can be tough reading. Just as we may be surprised that um, Adam and Eve weren't dead after their sin, we might be even more surprised that God didn't kill Cain after his sin. No, he's married with children who have children, who have children, who have children. You get where I'm going with that. Um, just as Adam's wife, <coughs> Eve, was the mother of all, um, Cain's wife is significant in the scripture too. As um, <laughs> I guess we kind of have to think about it as Cain's wife is the mother of a whole, uh, a whole group of rebels, generation after generation of rebels. <coughs> Verse 17 and 18. <coughs> Actually, I'm going to read to Verse 22. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore, bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the city, the, the name of the city, after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Majul, and Majul fathered Meshul, and Meshul fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. Uh-oh. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jubal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah also bore Tubalcane, and he was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubalcain was in Neymar. So, so far we see that Cain's, Cain's world is a microcosm of all of civilization. We can see that there is great progress taking place in civilization uh, within the generation of, uh, of, Cain, um, of Cain and uh, his son, and his son's son, his grandson. Uh, people are congregating into cities. Uh, others are living as uh, nomads and living in tents as they pasture their livestock. Uh, musical instruments are being made and played. Um, tools of bronze and iron are being made and used. Um, also, that led to weapons being, um, <laughs> being uh, made and used. Uh, people married and had families. Great deal of progress going on in those early generations. Um, uh, Adam is still alive. So uh, in those 930 years that Adam lived, there is an enormous amount of progress that is me being made uh, in civilization. We, uh, we see technical uh, prowess. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, we also see moral decline. And we saw that uh, at the beginning of the verse, in, in verse 19, when the scripture tells us that Lamech took two wives. 
that was in direct opposition to God's direction, instruction, command to Adam that a man shall leave his mother and father and take one wife and that they should be committed to one another forever, um, as, long as, uh, as long as they both live. Uh, Lamech um, had no business taking two wives, but so he did. Then Moses, uh, who's the writer of, these, uh, of this uh, Genesis, he pauses when he gets to Lamech. Um, the first thing wrong, of course, is that he has two wives. Verses 23 and 24. Then Lamech said to his wives, uh, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. Okay, Lamech. Uh, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Hmm. Um, Lamech has a, um, a tone here. Um, uh, it, it, we look at the words, the words are bad enough, but the tone is bragging, is he not? What is he bragging about? He's bragging that he murdered a man. You, you, you women, <laughs> I want you to listen up and hear what I'm saying. I, Lamech, your husband, murdered a man. I murdered him for a striking me. A little bit of overkill, no? We don't know the full story, of course, but Lamech is definitely bragging that he took it upon himself to take the life of a man who had wounded him. I don't know what the wound was. Uh, he had struck him. We don't know. We don't know the story. Um, it, it, but then the clincher here is he says, um, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech is seventy-sevenfold. That is dangerous speech. Um, I don't know if what Lamech, the fact that Lamech proclaimed this to his wives was a way of warning them of what might be their, um, what might be their, uh, their, um, uh, what would you call it, um, reality, if they should uh, deign to wound or strike or oppose Lamech. Um, I don't know. The scripture doesn't say, but the fact that he's proclaiming this to his two wives is kind of suspect. Um, this sixth generation grandfather, going back to Cain, had murdered his brother who had um, nothing to do with uh, why God rejected his offering. Abel was completely uh, guiltless. He hadn't picked a fight with Cain. Cain had f picked a fight with Abel. Um, Lamech is actually exulting in his actions, proud of it. He sings a song of praise. Uh, the first song of praise that we see in scripture is Adam's reaction to Eve when God presents her to him. This is the second um, uh, example of a, a, a song of praise or a poetry. And what is he doing? He's twisting, he's actually taking God's word, God's revenge against anyone who would um, seek to kill Cain, and uh, he's twisting it and applying it to himself. Um, let's go back to, um, let's go back to Genesis for uh, 14 and 15, uh, back to Cain. Cain says, Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. This is Cain's complaint to God that God's um, uh, proclamation of his punishment is too severe. He says, I'm going to be a, a fugitive and, and a wanderer in this world, and people are going to seek to kill me. My, I'm going to lose my life. And, and what is the response of God here? God promises Cain. He says, then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. 
And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Talk about a gracious God. What does God say when Cain says, they're going to kill me? God says, no, <laughs> no. Anybody that does seek to kill you um, is going to have to answer to me. I will avenge. If someone should kill you, Cain, I will avenge your death. I will take it on myself to avenge your death. And so Lamech, Lamech takes God's words and he twists them. So if God promised to avenge the death of Cain seven times for killing his brother, then what? Then that I deserve ten times that. Why he thought Lamech did that he deserved ten times the protection that Cain did, I don't know. I don't know why Lamech thought that. But he brags that what he did is going to earn him God's protection, so to speak. Um, he's gloating. <laughs> In essence, what is Lamech saying? He's saying, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I want to go where I want to go when I want to go there. And no one can hold me down and no one can hold me back. I will serve my sin and exult in it. That's what Lamech is saying. I am the commander of my own ship. I am the boss of my own job. I will do what I want and no one can touch me. That's what Lamech is saying. Um, what does God want us to do? He wants us to recognize our sin and repent of it. And what is Lamech doing? Not that. He is throwing it in God's face. And he's saying, if you can avenge what Cain did, then I expect you to avenge what I did. Now, Moses, um, we're going to pick up in chapter five. <laughs> we could spend a lot of time on that, couldn't we? Um, Moses switches to another ge genealogy in chapter five, um, obviously still from Adam. Uh, this one is um, concerns the line from which Jesus would come. So let's pick up in verse three of chapter five of Genesis. When Adam had lived 130 years, 930 years, no, I'm sorry, oh, 130 years. I thought it was a typo. Let me get again. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image, uh, and he named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. There are a number of schools of thought regarding the extensive ages mentioned in the scriptures, and some believe they are symbolic and that um, Adam, for example, didn't live 930 years. Um, personally, that's what the scripture says. I don't know why we should be expected to figure out that Adam didn't live really 930 years. Uh, we need to extrapolate that uh, down to a, a more reasonable, uh, realistic number. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, the scripture says what the scripture says, and um, it lists the the, the, the the days that the young um, uh, people lived um, over and over and over again. And we see that those years are declining as the uh, as the time goes on. There's nothing in scripture that indicates that they are symbolic, at least the way I, I view it. Um, but we do re need to remember that uh, early on, uh, in the generations between, uh, especially between Adam and Noah, um, there was very little disease. Uh, there were um, very few uh, genetic um, mutations that were forming uh, malformations of birth defects. Uh, they were birth defects were minimal. Birth um, uh, um, uh, mortality was a very uh, rare. Um, men and women were as healthy as they would ever be. Actually, men and women were as intelligent as they will ever be. Um, <laughs> Adam's intellect was above and beyond anything that we can even possibly imagine, just as uh, we, we may have gained 
um, it, um, uh, technology and that kind of thing, but um, that has not evolved uh, either. We are not smarter now than we were before. We just build on what it was that has been uh, developed uh, before us, going all the way back to uh, the, the generations surrounding um, um, these people, Cain. It's been a downhill battle. Downhill from there, mankind is not evolving. Uh, it is interesting that Moses said that Adam fathered a son in his own image and likeness, that he fathered a son in his own image and likeness. Um, Adam was made in God's image and likeness, and the scripture does say that. Adam was created, made in God's image and likeness, a sinless and uh, perfect. That's how Adam was made. But when Adam had sons, <clears throat> they were fathered in his image and likeness, neither perfect <clears throat> nor sinless. So that's what the scripture means, I think, when it says that <clears throat> he fathered a son in his own image. Unfortunately, we are made in Yes, God's image, but not in the sense that we are sinless and perfect. We are made in, we are fathered in Adam's sinful and imperfect likeness. Scripture tells us that Adam had other sons and daughters. In 930 years, I think he had a lot of sons and daughters uh, necessary to populate the earth. It wasn't actually until the time of Moses that uh, it was forbidden for, um, uh, for uh, people to marry close relatives. Uh, it did, never said that we were not um, allowed to marry relatives. If we were not allowed, it was forbidden for anyone to marry a relative, then there would be no marriages because we are all relatives. We are all sons and daughters of Adam. Um, but no, but we are forbidden to marry close relatives um, for two reasons. First of all, because it was not necessary, uh, because um, the world had been well populated. And secondly, because those mutations that I mentioned before were becoming more and more concentrated. So the possibility of two people that are closely related, uh, siblings or first cousins in particular, may share the same mutations. And so in uh, marrying and, um, and having children, they would intensify the possibility that those mutations would be passed on from generation to generation. So there was a reason why um, um, the, the marriage between relatives was allowed, and there was a reason why the marriage between relatives was forbidden. Um, it's a, uh, an interesting subject, and some people are just horrified, uh, horrified by even the discussion, uh, but it, it is, it is what it is. Um, this son, Seth, is mentioned specifically uh, because he is the father of the line that would produce the offspring that was promised uh, back in Genesis 3 that we looked at in our last lesson. When, when God says uh, in the midst of his proclamation of the, the, what is going to happen to the Satan and to Adam and Eve, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And the one that would do this, who is Jesus Christ, was born to the line, uh, to the line um, that came from Adam through his son, uh, Seth. Uh, and so Adam dies. He says he died at age 930. Uh, God said he would, even though Satan said he wouldn't. So if Adam and Eve were thinking after a while, maybe Satan was right and we're not going to die, uh, this would prove that, no, God was right and Satan was wrong. They did die physically. Uh, they had already, in essence, died spiritually in the garden, and now they died physically. 
um, and all those that come after Adam die physically too. And we would all die spiritually too if God himself did not make the provision to um, save us from dying spiritually. And so it would continue until the fullness of time comes and the offspring of Seth, who was, of course, the offspring of Adam, uh, comes to all uh, comes to undo all the uh, death and destruction that sin had had caused. Um, I hope that puts a, a, a little different spin on uh, what we have traditionally uh, thought when we have read the story, the narrative concerning Cain and Abel. Um, hope, hope, is, hope it's food for thought, and I will see you next time. God bless you.